Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Surfshark VPN, the sponsor of today's video. Hello gamers, this is the fifth in a series of six reviews we're doing on BoJack Horseman. If you're watching this one first without watching the other ones, What's wrong with you? You said it, Reginald. Also, I'm doing this with William, who murdered me at the end of the last video. But somehow, I returned. How is that possible? Cloning? Dark science? Secrets only character actress Margot Martindale knew? It doesn't matter, we're both back. Let's do season 5 now. Sorry this took so long, oh my god. Okay, cool. So, season 5, the penultimate season of the show. If you thought season 4 was a bit of a cooldown season for Bojack after the death of Serilyn, oh, don't worry. Everything only gets worse for him from here on out. Much, much worse. Season 5 calls a lot of its shots early and builds on them as it goes. Kinda hard to watch sometimes, intentionally so, as things get real later on. It also has another contender for best episode near the halfway point. Season 5 is a season that, to be honest, didn't fully grab me upon its initial release. I thought it was good, but not quite as strong as the previous seasons, and a surefire sign that the show was starting to wind down and needed to end before it lost its excellent edge. But, I have to say, rewatching it nowadays, it's a lot stronger than I gave it credit for initially, and it more than holds up when compared to the other seasons. I still think it gave off some indications that the show needed to wrap up soon, and we'll get to that later. But for the most part, yeah, this is still the typical BoJack excellence we've come to expect at this point. There are elements here and there that may be a bit too similar to previous seasons, which is probably why it doesn't stick out in my mind as much when I think about this show as a whole. But there's still a lot of amazing stuff to talk about, so let's jump right in. But first, did you know that this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN? Yeah, unlike Todd in this season, I actually remembered to buy ad space. Picture this, you're trying to watch the hit TV show Filbert, which aired on the now defunct WhatTimeIsItRightNow.com and has subsequently been added to Netflix. But only Netflix in Canada? They've had it too good for too long. What are us Americans supposed to do to access this geo-restricted content? Simple, sis. With Surfshark, you can trick your browser into thinking you're in another country, thus allowing you to access content you couldn't get otherwise. So if there's a show you want to watch that isn't available on American Netflix or the Netflix of whatever country you live in, Surfshark is the invaluable tool for you. Do you want alerts every time your WhatTimeIsItRightNow.com account password is compromised? Surfshark can help with that. Its Surfshark alert system will make sure you get alerts every time your email address or password is compromised. Surfshark alert scans various databases of leaked information and notifies its users if their data is found so they can take action, which is an incredible feature. Surfshark is also totally unlimited, meaning you can use it on as many devices as you like, even all at the same time. No other VPN allows this. Go to surfshark.deal slash Rillis and enter promo code Rillis to get 83% off and 3 extra months of Surfshark VPN for free. It's an amazing deal, and it's even better because it comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're not satisfied, you can cancel during those 30 days and get your money back. If you're looking for a great VPN, there's no reason not to give Surfshark a try. Once again, head to surfshark.deal slash Rillis and enter the promo code Rillis. Have a great time with Surfshark VPN. Okay, now back to the epic analysis. Okay, so, Season 5 starts off by jumping right into the filming of the new show, Filbert. This was the show PC signs Bojack up for at the end of the previous season. And right off the bat, we have a parallel to Season 2. Once again, we get to see the behind-the-scenes process of filming in Hollywood. Though, instead of a movie, it's a TV show. And while in Season 2 it felt more like a general spoof of how productions go, this one plays with more serious topics related to it. Themes of sexism and abuse, which we'll cover throughout the video. Basically, everything Bojack Horseman hinted at way back in Hank after dark is now at the forefront. But I'm getting ahead of myself! Bojack is filming Filbert, a gritty detective show to air on a streaming service. The interesting thing to note is that the set for Filbert looks exactly like his house. Hey, wow, that's so crazy! I wonder what kind of wacky shenanigans that could lead to. The shenanigans were not wacky at all. I really like how quickly the season subtly sets up one of its main recurring themes. The idea that Bojack is struggling to tell fiction from reality. The fact that his house and the set of his new TV show looks identical just seems like a quirky funny Bojackism that the show is known for. But it's actually the first of many subtle elements that set up Bojack's steadily declining mental health over the course of the season, as well as that dreaded episode 11. Bojack straight up says in this episode that he doesn't like playing a drunk asshole like Filbert, to which PC reassures him that it's just a character, and at the end of the day, he can take the costume off and be himself again. But as the season progresses, he keeps wearing that costume all the time without even noticing, even when he's not filming the show. But the good news is, in this first episode, he doesn't wear the costume. Or anything. Because he has to do a scene in the nude. Yeah, first we have to talk about Bojack's massive, throbbing horse cock. Wait, what? James, he's a horse. D do you know how big horses are? 
William, if these videos get demonetized, that affects your pay too. Well, you'll, you'll appeal the claim. Anyway, Bojack's dick. So the main plot for in this episode is how Flip, the writer-director, is kinda sorta of an oblivious sexist moron, and he keeps writing the female characters to be sex objects to attract the male gaze, and Bojack is trying to fight it to A, appease his new co-star Gina, and B, to make himself look like a good person. Going back to the ongoing issue of him not wanting to be... himself. Flip and PC's solution to this is, of course, to have Bojack change a light bulb completely naked while the camera points right at his dick. We don't actually see his cock, but you know it's there. It's always there. And everyone in the show seems very impressed. Also, the episode ends with fish titties. Overall, a solid start to the season. When Flip tells Bojack this is gonna be one sensational season of television, he wasn't lying. Also, I have to say I really love whattimeisitrightnow.com. That's so genius to develop such a stupid website and give it a slew of TV shows, because that's basically what our current media landscape looks like. Just endless streaming services as far as the eye can see, each dumber than the last. Bojack was yet again ahead of the curve in predicting this. Oh yeah, other characters appeared in this episode too, but their main plot lines really start coming into play later in the season. So we'll talk about them later in the season. With the exception of Toad. What is our good friend Toadsworth up to these days? Well, ever since the end of the last season, he's been dating Yolanda, since they're both asexual and that's it. That's, that's all they have in common. Fellow aces, has this ever happened to you? You're scrolling through a dating app and you finally find another rare elusive asexual after 3,000 years of searching and then you look at their profile and realize damn we have nothing else in common and we're probably not compatible yeah that's Todd and Yolanda it's pretty realistic to the ace experience honestly I think overall this show does wonders for asexual representation because it actually explains all these facets of the experience accurately in a way that literally no other show I've seen has done it taught me a lot of stuff I didn't even really know and I think it's neat but there's another aspect of Todd that I kinda didn't care for this season. It's a problem that also bleeds into season 6, but it kinda started with this season, so I want to address it here first. I don't think the show really knows if it wants to take Todd's accomplishments seriously, or treat them as jokes. Cause in the span of these first few episodes, it really can't make up its mind about him. Basically, Todd applies to be a janitor at whattimeitisrightnow.com and gets promoted to the head of marketing instead, since the interviewer was impressed with his insane resume that he's accrued over the years. Now, this is a really funny joke, because we know all these accomplishments, like being a fashion icon or the governor of California, were all just wacky Todd shenanigans he stumbled into accidentally. Even though in-universe, those are crazy amazing achievements, and it makes sense why this company would want Todd as the head. But meanwhile, you have Yolanda not really being impressed with Todd's accomplishments and being a bit embarrassed of him. She tells him that she's concerned about how he has no job or direction in life. But like, this motherfucker was the governor of California! And if this accomplishment can be taken seriously enough to get him a prestigious job, how come his girlfriend doesn't consider it anything worth noting? Why does she feel the need to lie about Todd going to college to her family when he's done so much more notable stuff over the course of the series? I guess Yolanda's more of a straight man character who sees Todd's wacky shenanigans for the wacky shenanigans that they are, much like Bojack did. But her wacky family would probably be impressed with all these accomplishments, and yet she still feels the need to lie to them about Todd. Yeah, so in episode 3, Todd and Yolanda visit Yolanda's family. Hi, Jinx and Sue. No, really, this is probably the wackiest this season is gonna get since there isn't much of a place for it later on. In a subversion of the typical coming out to your family storyline, Yolanda and Todd have to come out as asexual to her family, who are all very sexually charged, with her mom being a famous porn actress, her dad is an erotica artist, and her sister is a slut. In the past, Yolanda dressed up as her twin sister to get with her boyfriend and make her jealous. However, this is when Yolanda found out that she was asexual and didn't go through with the sex in the end. But her sister didn't know that, and now, in an act of revenge, she dressed as Yolanda to get with Todd. This all ends in a slapstick sequence involving a DK barrel of 100-year-old lube. Also, there's another cock joke. Here's the plan. We'll wait until the cock crows midnight. Who is this cock? It's midnight! And I'm the cock of the walk! They all have a very respectful conversation in the end, and everything ends nicely except for Todd confronting Yolanda about her lie and breaking up with her. The conversation seems to imply that Yolanda really only wanted to be with Todd out of convenience. They're both ace, so they may as well be together. But she was never able to get over how Todd lives his life. Yolanda lies to her family about Todd going to college, which, in the grand scheme of things, isn't really something to lie about. He's the head of marketing! That is way more impressive than a BA in English. 
it feels like she sees his wacky accomplishments as a sign of immaturity. It shows that Yolanda liked the idea of dating Todd more than she liked Todd himself. Even if it's just a small lie, it's a lie that doesn't matter, so why lie at all? Like, if you're gonna lie about that, what else are you lying about? That's not a great relationship. But they at least remain friends and do the good old-fashioned, hey, if we're still single by the time we're 100, let's get married plan that everyone at the age of 25 makes with their best friend. William, how old are you? 25. I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, fuck you. But yeah, that kind of ties up the remaining Freds from last season for Todd, and gets him into Filbert. This is also the last we see of Yolanda. I kind of feel like she should have stuck around longer. Yeah, we know why the relationship was so short, but... I don't know, I feel like they could have explored the two a bit more. She was only ever in like five episodes and the poof, gone. Also, I sure hope you enjoyed the Todd slapstick here because we're also sadly done with that for the most part. After this, he's mainly behind the desk for the rest of the season. He's head of marketing now, allegedly. They say he's head of marketing, but for the most part, it's really just a set of a punchline at the end of the season. They really just treat him as a second CEO or producer here so he can have input on Filbert. But hey, at least we get to see Todd interact with Bojack again. It's only for like two episodes, but hey, it's something. Sometimes Todd feels a little bit aimless when he isn't being used as a foil for another character. So it's good to see him get some classic interactions again. And while this does improve as we get into the final season, uh, that's a topic I'd like to save for that video. But I'm acknowledging that now so we don't get 15 comments on how actually he gets his O plot next season. Yeah, we know. We wrote the outline before the pandemic. I personally really love how Bojack and Todd only have a couple of civil and classic interactions this season, while also not really being friends again after the events of season 3. It's like, the F-bomb in that season stuck, their dynamic was never really the same after it, but Todd still treats Bojack nicely and he doesn't seem to hold anything against Bojack, while also not welcoming him back into his life. This is another realistic sort of interaction this season shows off really well. I've had falling outs with friends before, and after some distance from them for a couple years, we've had perfectly pleasant one-off interactions with each other. With some people, it's kind of nice to just get some distance and let animosity die out over time, while also making sure you're not really in each other's life anymore. Anyway, back to Toodles and Yolanda. I really loved all the wacky slapstick in this subplot, and I love how they adapted the fact that Todd is asexual into his off-the-wall character. It's so fun how his asexuality directly contributes to all this chicanery, as well as a certain other character he introduces to us later in the season. Still, part of me kind of wishes they used his asexuality more throughout the whole season, with some of those uses being taken a bit more seriously. I get that there's only so much time this season, and there's a lot of plot lines they're focusing on, but I am starving for this content. My non-existent asexual children are dying. Please, sir, may we have some more? can't believe I just referenced Oliver, how disgusting. But I did really like Todd's realization that he and Yolanda just weren't really compatible, and that they should break up and try to find other asexuals out there, no matter how daunting of a task that may seem. It's an incredibly mature moment for his character, and I really love that it was him who came to that conclusion, rather than Yolanda. Okay, that was a lot of Todd talk. Who's next on the discussion board? Diane! I really like how this season gives all of the supporting characters an episode in the spotlight. With the exception of Todd, but he got it last season, so that's alright. The first of said characters is Diane, which is definitely welcome. When I was looking at the Bojack wiki to remind myself of various plot points while writing this, I was shocked to see that this is only the second Diane-focused episode in the entire show, with the last one being in season 1. And that episode was terrible and kinda skippable to be honest. You'd think there'd be more more episodes specifically about her at this point, considering she's arguably the second most important character in the show. Maybe you can make an argument for Princess Carolyn, but I still think it's Diane. And I'm not just saying that because I like her character a lot more than PC. The series starts when she first enters Bojack's life, and it ends at what is presumably the last time she ever interacts with him. She's an incredibly vital foil for Bojack, and she's crucial to keeping him grounded and trying to make him a better person. But has she ever really gotten much of her own characterization as an individual? Most plot points with her tend to revolve around either Bojack or Mr. Peanut Butter, and how she deals with their chicanery. I love this episode because it shows her on her own, now separated from her husband and trying to figure out who exactly she is anymore. The end of season 4 did not paint things in a positive light for their marriage, but I'm gonna be honest, I didn't expect them to immediately split up at the start of this season. I thought maybe there'd be a little more of them desperately trying to fix things between the- Nope! They are already split apart by episode 1. I was a little blindsided when I first saw the season, not gonna lie, but I guess this was the best way to do things since their marriage falling apart was an inevitability, so we might as well just save time and jump right into the aftermath. 
Episode 2 begins with Diane sob- well, Yeah, we go out of order hard here. Episode 2 begins with Diane sobbing on her way to the airport. She needs to escape from LA as soon as possible, and she does not care where she goes. So she ends up in Vietnam, so she can connect her for roots. But as soon as she heads over there, her boss tells her, Girl, we need to get some primo content for our killer site. Get listen, bestie. So she has to finagle a way to get her vacation time in and make content for her job. Just like Seth Rogen. She fails at both. The first immediate roadblock is that despite being Vietnamese, Diane is 100% born and raised American and therefore does not speak a lick of Vietnamese. This puts her at a disadvantage from the people who live there and tourists who see her and thus assume she speaks Vietnamese and has poor English, which is not true. The language barrier is actually the crux of a lot of things that happen to her here. Here. I can surprisingly relate to Diane a lot in this episode, since despite being a pasty white boy, I also happen to be a pasty white boy who's Greek. But being born and raised in America makes it a little hard to really connect with the culture I came from, outside of Greek-themed events at my Greek church and talking to my grandparents. I still don't personally know the language and I've never been to Greece myself, but I imagine if I ever went there, it would be familiar, yet somewhat isolating. I might even feel a dash of imposter syndrome, baby! However, unlike Diane, I wouldn't have to deal with obnoxious American tourists assuming this is where I'm from and being extremely condescending, so there's that, I guess. Here are some examples of what problems she experienced experiences because of that barrier. She has those aforementioned tourists assuming that she doesn't speak English and can guide them to where they need to go, and they just won't back down at all. This would have been avoided if Diane peppered in like, three more words, but hey, she's had a hard week. Let her live. Uh Sins. There's also some general smaller issues like having a hard time ordering food at a fast food place or a beer at the hotel bar because the staff doesn't know what she's saying, nor does she know what they're saying. The biggest set piece for this episode is the date Diane goes on. Context. The main reason Diane chose to go to Vietnam was to reconnect with her roots and escape the Hollywood bubble for a while. But upon arriving, she finds out that a big Hollywood production is being shot in Vietnam. Everywhere she turns in what she thought was her homeland, she is reminded of what she ran away from. To get back to the date, she goes out with an American who just so happens to work on the set of that movie. However, since he assumes that Diane is native to Vietnam, he assumes that she has poor English. But instead of correcting him, she instead decides to play along, and is silent for the majority of the date. It works until he brings her to the set of the movie, and she slips out of character and speaks English right in front of him, ending the date. You could argue whether or not it was a good thing for her to do this, but that guy was a dick and probably deserved it. What first sets all this off was a party Diane was at. The housewarming party for Mr. Peanut Butter to be exact. Since you know his last run got kinda sorta fucking destroyed or something, this episode cuts back and forth a lot between Diane's vacation, complete with inner monologues of her writing the article for her job, and the events back in LA that led to her booking it to the airport in the first place. What actually set her off was seeing Mr. Peanut Butter hook up with his new girlfriend Pickles at the party. We haven't exactly talked about Mr. Peanut Butter yet, but really most of what goes on with him right now is there to service Diane's story. All you need to know is he's divorced, meets another cute, fun young woman in her 20s, and starts dating her. Time is a flat circle and also an arrow or something. Diane's monologue at the end of the episode is really powerful, and one element of it I particularly like is how she acknowledges that she misses Mr. Peanut Butter, despite the fact that she's the one who wanted to get divorced. It's a really complicated but realistic feeling. Sometimes you're with someone and you know deep down that you're not compatible or that it's not gonna last, so you assume you're gonna be fine once it's over. But there's obviously a reason you were together in the first place. Hell, there might be a bunch of reasons. And you still miss those good attributes of the relationship. Those parts that aren't going to be in your life anymore. Yeah, Diane needed to cut it off with Mr. Peanut Butter because they weren't compatible overall. But you can't blame her for feeling this way now. It's only natural she would miss the best parts of their relationship. Overall, this is one of my favorite episodes of the season. It really does right by Diane's character, and it's super heartbreaking as well. Plus, it ends with a Vietnamese cover of Back in the 90s, which is one of my favorite recurring elements of this season. We all love Back in the 90s, and the extreme mood whiplash it gives us at the end of most episodes, but by the fifth season of it... Yeah, we could stand to shake things up a bit. So this season introduces a bunch of unique covers that fit the tones of different episodes, like the Vietnamese version for this one, a simple, beautiful string cover for a PC-focused episode, a punk rock cover for an episode that involves drugs, an organ cover for a certain funeral episode, and my personal favorite, the spooky version that plays at the end of the Halloween episode. 
Yeah, in case you didn't notice, that Halloween version is the credits theme for all my videos. For a while, I used to alternate between all the different Season 5 credit covers, depending on my mood for the video. But then I kind of just settled on this one being the ending for all of them, because I'm too lazy to change it between videos. And the only reason I use these covers is because the traditional back in the 90s gets copyright claimed. And the only reason I wanted that as my credits theme is because it's a tribute to how it always ends off every one of my YouTube poops. Are you fucking kidding me? Now you know the full lineage of the Shea Furless credits. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. These covers are dope, and while it makes it so there's less mood whiplash moments than there are in previous seasons, that's perfectly fine. They're a great change of pace. I mean, I'd argue a fucking car crash followed by punk rock guitar is kind of a mood whiplash, if the crash itself wasn't already whiplash. Bazinga. Also, before someone brings it up, these videos specifically, we've been using the Arcade Tales cover of the song. We use that because I'm friends with him and asked him if we could. And if you didn't know that's where it's from, go listen to the full version of it and go give it a bunch of views. Okay, bye, Tiki. So aside from Princess Carolyn, who we'll talk about at length when we get to episode 5, we're kind of jumping around a lot here, bear with us. We've essentially set up all the core recurring cast. But what about our new recurring characters for the season? Well, we get two here, Gina Cazador and Flip, who we saw briefly at the end of season 4. Flip is... What you see is what you get. Take a good look at him and y you know who he is. Look at this dude. Gonna be honest, I don't really get what they were going for with Flip. In a lot of episodes, he's just a typical misogynistic self-proclaimed genius and we're not supposed to like him. Okay, makes sense. But then there are some episodes where it feels like they're trying to make him more sympathetic. Like when he's a dolphin, bear with us, it's gonna make perfect sense in a little bit. And he's just kind of having a breakdown, not sure what to write, so Diane helps him through the process. I guess it kind of shows that he's a hack and not good at writing at all and that's the joke. But I don't know. He never really ends up called out by anyone in the show for the misogynistic stuff he does. And his last appearance in the season is just kind of a joke about his hack writing abilities. And by that point, I'm just kind of thinking, what really is the point of this character? If he's supposed to be an antagonist, why is he never treated as such? And if he's supposed to be comic relief, why is he so unlikable? I don't know. He had some funny moments at least. Okay, but what about Sassy Malone over here? Boobs! Gina is Bojack's co-star in the show and, spoiler, love interest for the season. Gina is the kind of actress who shows up, does her job, gets paid, rinse and repeat. She keeps her head down in order to succeed in this world. She tries to keep her work life and personal life separate. Too bad she's her Bojack now because we all know that bitch can't let that slide. Okay, so Bojack tries to learn more about Gina, right? So he snatches her earbuds while she's at the caring booth only to realize she is listening to a Broadway musical. Did someone say Broadway musical? Holy shit, this show is talking about Broadway musicals now! Yeah! Dude, you've seen the show, you knew this was coming. You better f***ing believe I knew it was coming. I liked Gina enough in episode 1, but revealing that she's a closet fan of musicals really caught my attention. It's really powerful to see how a musical about corn inspired her. And in a similar vein to Bojack trying to make Eddie fly in the hopes that that would cheer him up, Bojack gets her a singing audition with PC and Flip in the hopes that she'll get to use her musical talents in the show. But it's the usual overstepping his bounds sort of deal. She's nervous and doesn't do too well, and begrudgingly thanks Bojack for the fact that now she doesn't have to wonder if she'll make it as a singer anymore, since she believes she won't. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Much like Hollyhock in the previous season, Gina's an amazing addition to the cast. She and Bojack gradually warm up to each other, and her struggles as an actress are really compelling. I hope this doesn't end badly. Speaking of ending badly, oh look, Mr. Peanut Boober and Pickleys! Are you implying that Mr. Peanut Butter is bad at sex? No, he's clearly very good at it, he's just bad at everything else. Yeah, so Mr. Peanut Butter is probably candidate for worst character this season? Season, he kind of fucks up at every single opportunity. He doesn't do a damn thing right. I still have feelings for Diane. Dude, what are you doing? We're blowing this. What were we supposed to say? I guess we should start with the beginning of the relationship. He meets Pickles while he's at dinner with Diane while they negotiate the terms of their divorce. She keeps interrupting and it's clear they have a thing, much to Diane's dismay. They rush into their relationship when Mr. Peanutbutter is clearly not ready for a serious relationship so soon after a divorce. It almost feels like this relationship is dead on arrival and that he might be in a never-ending pattern that will never break. Oh golly gee oh my, I wonder if that will be addressed in a future episode of the season. But before that, these two go on a date to technically a KFC, which stands for Kiki's French Cuisine, <laughs> followed by a romantic night at a fireworks show. And by fireworks, we mean a satellite exploding. Here is revealed that he still has feelings for Diane, and that makes Pickles big sad. She is now in a yes. But they make up for now, yay! While we're talking about these crazy ass doggos, I gotta say, I don't really care for Pickles. She's fine, she's just kind of a typical young, hip, trendy character who's there to illustrate Mr. P. LaBoober's continued romance 
romantic failings. Other than that, she's just kind of boring. Not bad, but nothing special. And hey, Mr. Peanut Butter may be f***ing a lot of things up this season, but he still delivers one of the most relatable lines I've ever heard. I don't have or want children, but I silently judge every parent that I see in public. <laughs> That's legit just me. Anyway, episode 4 is this season's topical episode, with this one being about feminism and the Me Too movement, and how cancel culture doesn't do a damn thing to bad people's careers. It only sets them back a couple years at most. Because we're introduced to Vance Wagner, which is honestly a really good name for a deplorable person, because he's a deplorable person who does a ton of really shitty things and then gets canceled for them. Boy, I sure hope he goes away forever now, except of course he doesn't, because Philbert needs a new bad boy star, and his name is brought up by Princess Carolyn. Yeah, you guys kind of get what I was talking about in the last episode when I said I'm not a big fan of her morally questionable actions that no one else in the fan base seems to address. It hardly ever feels like PC is on the side of women who get wronged in the entertainment industry. Because it feels like she is the industry, perpetuating so many things that make Hollywood so much harder for women. She has a lot of depth and relatability to her character, and I'm not denying that. Plus, Bojack is obviously a million times worse in terms of his reprehensible actions, but the show always makes it a point to show how bad Bojack is, while never really examining PC's role in perpetuating Hollywood's shitty systems. The only woman who gets called out in this episode for propping up problematic abusers is Anna Spanakopita, which makes sense because of how cold and stoic her demeanor is, and how she's a side character we're never really meant to empathize, emphasize, empathize, empathize, and how she's a side character we're never really meant to empathize with all that much. There, I got it first try that time. I don't, I don't get why he's talking hard. But it definitely makes for an interesting concept when Diane tries to call her out for working with Vance Wagner, only for her to flip the script and use Diane's words as a way to try and get Vance back into society's good graces. It's fucked up, but it's pretty realistic, unfortunately. I would like to point out that while, yes, it does make sense for Diane to call out Anna at this time, she is also literally friends with Princess Carolyn, who is responsible for all this happening in the first place, and you'd think she'd go harder on her. Oh, also Diane becomes a writer on the show. Meanwhile, Bojack accidentally becomes a feminist. While at a ceremony for Vance, Bojack is too disgusted by the honeydew on the table to participate in the standing ovation for Waggy Boy. As the star of the show, Vance is positioned to co-star her in, this sends a message that Bojack does not condone this. When in reality, Bojack's just gaming. So now Bojack is viewed as a feminist icon and says a whole lot of things that definitely won't incriminate him later on in the show. This is just old Bojack talking, but how about we don't choke any women? Yeah, the foreshadowing in this episode is just... Ooh boy, mega oof. Also, this episode has a subplot where Mr. Power Ranger wants to be seen as tough in order to land a role. So he enlists Todd's help in getting the general public to think he's tough. It's cute and fun to see him fail in increasingly loony ways. And in general, this subplot feels like the kind of thing you find in season one or two, where Mr. Peanut Butter and Todd would just get into wacky chicanery together. It was certainly a nice throwback. And with that, all five of the main characters are now working on Filbert in some capacity. I think that's really cool that they're all connected to this one show, even if it doesn't necessarily amount to anything significant plot or character-wise. It's just nice for cohesion purposes. And now it's time for Princess Carolyn's plot for the season. Last season, her storyline involved trying to make a baby. This time, it's about legally acquiring someone else's baby in a convoluted process known as adoption. And it sucks. Her adoption manager, which by the way, it's hilarious thinking Princess Caroline is someone else's client for once, gets switched out with literal trash human, insert name here, which makes everything overly difficult for our not mom to be. She pairs Princess Caroline up with Sadie, a reluctant mom in Georgia. The two get along fine for the most part, but as the episode goes on, and namely through all the interruptions Princess Carolyn experiences due to the constant phone calls from the Philbrook crew, the cracks begin to show. Sadie wonders if PC is all show and reconsiders giving her the baby after the father unexpectedly returns. I mean, having the baby was unexpected to begin with. That's a pun. I'm gonna kill him. So PC has to return to LA empty-handed. I mean, technically she would have either way because it takes nine months, but you know. Additionally, in this episode, we're treated to multiple flashbacks of PC's life growing up back in the South. As it turns out, she has a similar backstory. Having a fling with a football-playing son of a wealthy businessman and gets knocked up. Carolyn's mom actually sees this as a good thing since that would mean We're in the money. But as you can probably guess, she has a miscarriage. What do you mean you lost the baby? Go find it. 
These sections end with her getting accepted to UCLA, and the rest is history. This episode offers a really laid-back setting that contrasts perfectly with a constantly bustling LA, in a manner similar to Escape from LA. Wow, that episode was very appropriately named, huh? It's nice to see that Sadie can see through PC's Hollywood salesman persona and that she's smarter than PC assumes, but it's also pretty devastating because despite all of her faults, it's so easy to feel for PC's plight to acquire baby. We've seen all the hardships she had to endure when trying to get one, both through the entire rest of the series and the flashbacks in this episode. It really is devastating. Devastating. Not quite as much of a gut punch as Ruthie, but it wasn't really designed to be. It's here to fill in more of her backstory and show where she came from so we can better admire how far she's come. The Amelia Earhart motif in this episode is a smart one, and it's a good metaphor for her journey throughout the series. She flew farther than anyone expected, but kinda got lost along the way. There's probably a deeper metaphor there, but I don't feel like finding it right now. Oh, also the rest of the cast is in this episode. Throughout her time down south, PC is subjected to many a phone call from the Filber crew. This essentially leads to shenanigans involving Bojack doing a dangerous stunt that results in breaking his back. Hey, remember we said this was a laid-back episode? Whoa, Lang's the only thing he's gonna be doing for a while. This is also, if you can believe it, the catalyst for the big issue this season that causes everything to go horribly wrong. Do you see what happens when you leave, Princess Carolyn? And now we get to episode 6, Free Churro. Um, okay, not quite sure where to even begin here. Well, Bojack's mom is fucking dead, you can start there. That's fair. So this episode is all about Bojack giving a eulogy at his mother's funeral. And when I say all about, I mean it. Aside from the cold open, which depicts a scene from Bojack's childhood that only features him and his dad, this episode is entirely just Bojack at a podium, at a funeral, giving a eulogy. And it's easily one of the best episodes in the entire show. I remember watching this one for the first time, and it only hit me six or seven minutes into the episode that, wait, they're not gonna cut away to any other characters, are they? This is literally just him talking the whole time. In essence, it's the anti-fish out of water, which featured a lot of visual storytelling, but no actual dialogue. Here, it's entirely dialogue based, or rather, monologue based. Or rather, based. As we watch Bojack reflect on all the shitty times he and his mother had together, and come to terms with what his mother's death really means for him going forward. What makes this episode truly sensational is the fact that it reveals so many new layers for Beatrice, Butterscotch, and even Bojack's character. How is it that in the middle of season 5 out of 6, we're still unraveling new aspects of Bojack's character? It's truly remarkable. For years, we've always known that Bojack turned out as shitty as he did, largely due to his parents' influence. Obviously, this is not an excuse for his heinous actions, but it makes sense that he would do such heinous actions given how he was raised. But Bojack is a far less evil character than either of his parents, and this episode establishes that everything he knows about being good, he learned from TV. Of course, this means his perception of goodness is stilted and unrealistic. He notes that he has to be good every day, and that he can't just do a big gesture like getting on a boat and saving his best friend. We saw that even after he did that for Todd in the season 2 finale, in a moment that at the time seemed to be an indication that their friendship was going to be just fine, it ended up being not fine afterwards. The same goes for Herb, or even Charlotte to some extent. Bojack never truly internalized what being a good person meant, believing one act of kindness could fix any of his relationships or make him whole. But that's not how it works. His life isn't a TV show. Well, it is, technically, but, I mean, you know, fuck it, you know what I mean. The eulogy is also an excuse for Bojack to vent out all his frustrations about his mother, and it's pretty cathartic for him and for us. Some of the anecdotes he tells, like one about how his mother bought him a jacket he wanted, except no, haha, she didn't, he was pranking us by telling a fake story, are sad, but pretty expected. But there's this undercurrent throughout his eulogy, this subtle, buried desire for a good relationship with his mother. It's a very compelling and tangible feeling that I think everyone can relate to. No matter who you are, and no matter how good or bad or awful your relationships with your parents are, you always want them to be better. You imagine idealized versions of them. Caring, supportive, loving, everything you think other people have, or everything you see on TV or in the movies. Some people are lucky enough to have that, and some aren't. But that longing for a better relationship with them is always there, and it's what Bojack conveys throughout the episode. 
He highlights how for brief moments during the parties Beatrice held at their house, he felt the sense of familial connection he always wanted. Whenever Beatrice would dance and take flight, as he puts it, Butterscotch would come out and watch in a rare moment of admiration. And Bojack would take it in, understanding how significant these moments were for his entire family. They always silently acknowledged that they were drowning in this house together. But in these moments, they could all swim. He tells this story with a subtle organ playing in the background, truly taking the time to reflect on it and getting lost imagining the moment. But then he comes back to cynical reality and acknowledges that the drowning is kind of inevitable. He lived his entire life drowning and watching his parents drown, until his dad finally succumbed to a duel of all things. That's the stupidest goddamn thing ever, but it's completely in character for Butterscotch, especially because he died by tripping on a rock and not from the actual duel, lol. So that was the end of Bojack's relationship with his father, but deep down he always held out hope that things would be okay with his mother in the end, against his better judgment. And for a brief moment, he thought he had it. His mother's last words to him in the hospital were, I see you. And he spends the episode's runtime trying to decipher this cryptic message. What does it mean? Was she being nice in her dying moments and finally acknowledging his presence after all the shit she put him through? Was it a sinister, I see you, you piece of garbage sort of acknowledgement? He couldn't figure it out for the longest time, and his vivid descriptions of the message's possible meanings shift our brains into overdrive in turn. I believed, for a stupid goddamn couple of minutes, that the message meant something positive, or even something at all. I thought Beatrice had reverted to the same state of mind she was in when we last saw her in Time's Arrow, where she felt no animosity towards her son and engaged with him in a friendly manner. I thought she was trying to do that one last time. But this is Bojack Horseman, and you can't have happy endings in this show, because if everyone's happy, the show would be over. There's always more show. And so we learn the true origin of this message. She was just reading the sign in the ICU unit. It's such a simple revelation, and yet it's one of the most devastating moments in the entire series. I actually cry every time at this part. In the end, there really was no way for Bojack to salvage his relationship with his mother, in spite of his efforts at the end of Time's Arrow. And he finally understands the meaning behind his mother's words when she gave a eulogy for his father. My mother is dead. And everything is worse now. Because now I know I will never have a mother who looks at me from across the room and says, Bojack Horseman, I see you. This really is one of the most sensational episodes of television I've ever seen. Both the writing and Will Arnett's delivery as the only actor in the entire episode come together to form this flawless reflection on what it means to live with someone awful and the complicated, messy feelings that can arise from that. It's by far the best episode of the season. But I do want to bring up the implications that statement has on the rest of the season. Ultimately, this episode has very little to do with the rest of Season 5's plot, only getting referenced a couple times in the very next episode, and it mainly stands as an epilogue to Season 4's plot, and Time's Arrow in particular. This, to me, kind of indicates how Season 4's main plotline is just a lot stronger than Season 5's. Obviously, Season 5's plotline is still great, but a lot of it is familiar territory for the show, from Bojack working on a project to spiraling due to drugs. Season 4 was just an extremely tough act to follow, both in terms of being really compelling and a super unique plotline the show hadn't done before. And the fact that none of the other episodes in Season 5 are quite as exceptional as this one, which feels explicitly tied to Season 4's storyline above all else, does kinda say something. But that's not a knock against Season 5 as a whole. Again, it was just really hard to follow up the Beatrice storyline. Also, there's a lot of stuff in this episode I didn't mention for the sake of time, like why the episode is called Free Churro. It's cause Bojack got a free churro. You're welcome for this epic analysis. Thank you for that epic monologue, Mr. Horserellis. I am also in this video, but I didn't know what to say. That wasn't just summary. Also, I was eating McDonald's. Did you know that someone uploaded the entire script for this episode to Genius? What the fuck? Anyway, next episode. And I sure hope you like the funny, because this episode has the funny. So this episode is framed by a couple telling stories to each other about their clients. A therapist named Dr. Indira and her wife, Mary Beth, a workplace counselor. And wouldn't you know it, their clients are Bojack, Diane, Todd, and Princess Guy. I mean, Bobo, Princess Diane. 
Diana, and through her finger face in a tangled fog of pulsating yearning in the shape of a woman. My favorite Kingdom Hearts boss. I like how Princess Carolyn is not a princess anymore, but Diana is. I wonder if they caught that in the studio. Yeah, due to legal restrictions, they can't say their actual names, so they all get aliases and redesigns for this episode. It is The Big Neat. They even changed the title of the show, that's adorable. So Bobo accidentally goes to therapy at Diana's request. He just thinks it's two friends talking, but once he learns his therapy, he wants out because he is man, and man do not want therapy. He want bottle emotion. Ook ook, I am Grug. However, it turns out that Indira is both Diana and Bobo's therapist, so finding out that Bobo is going to her therapist, Diane gets very uncomfortable with this and leaves. This puts Indira in quite the pickle, as she just lost two clients in one fell swoop for no good reason, because Bobo and Diana are fucking stupid. We don't really learn more about Bobo here, it's just, oh look, Bobo is stubborn and won't actually get help despite knowing damn well he needs it. But it does tell us more about Diana, like how she died in a tunnel, I, I, I mean, we see how uncomfortable she is around Bobo now that she knows about the tape, so it makes her uncomfortable having him now involved with the same therapist as her, especially since she's talking to Indira about the penny tape from two episodes ago that we forgot to mention apparently, but more about that soon, okay James, is that reward enough for you? And in addition, it kind of goes back to the bell room situation. This is one less thing she has to herself now that Bobo is there as well. She has one less safe haven from the hectic Hollywood life. This has really taken a toll on her. And while I do think it's a little lame on Diana's part to bail out the moment Bobo's getting help, well, not bail out directly, but she pulls the it's either him or me thing, and yeah, it does make perfect sense why she doesn't want to be surrounded by him 24-7 and why she wouldn't want them going to the same therapist. Maybe she could have given him more resources and choices for where to go, but also Bobo is stubborn and won't actually get help, like a dumbass. Also, Indira is never seen again and does not get her clients back. Oops. While that's going on, Emperor Fingerface and the tangled fog of pulsating yearning in the shape of a woman are having a workplace dispute over some string cheese that was wrongly eaten. And honestly, that's about it. It's just a cute, funny subplot between characters who don't really get to interact all that much even though they live together. So anyway, back to the main plot. While the Bobo framing device is fun and a neat change of pace, the showrunners know that they have to cut it before the end of the episode once the story starts getting a little more serious. So we return to Bojack and Diane after not seeing them all episode. Stupid Bobo and Diana hogging all the spotlight, SMH. Once Diane realizes that Bojack quit talking to Dr. Indira and that he doesn't really care about getting better, he tries to argue that neither of them need therapy and that they're the same. And they are not the same, according to Diane. I mean, they kind of are in a lot of ways, so I guess Diane is in diane -ial. Nailed it. And then Diane does something I really don't like. So here's the thing. I've been largely tiptoeing around my feelings about Diane throughout this review series because I know she's kind of contentious within parts of the fandom. And to be perfectly honest, that's never really been something I've bought into. It seems like a lot of fans are constantly mad at her for calling out Bojack on his shit and generally take his side in a lot of the show's conflicts. But in my opinion, Diane's usually right. She's a flawed character and she makes mistakes here and there, but she's a far more moral character than Bojack, and usually when she calls him out for something, it's completely justified. I don't dislike her character at all, far from it. She's actually one of my favorites in a show loaded with great characters. But that makes this one scene kind of difficult to talk about because this is the only part of the entire show where I kind of think she made a big, incredibly heinous oopsie. You see, at the end of episode 4, Anna Spanakopita shared a certain tape with Diane. It was a tape from back in season 3 where Bojack admitted what he did to Penny in New Mexico. Of course, he didn't mention Penny by name and certain specifics are left out, meaning Diane doesn't know the full story here, just that it sounds really bad. Which it was. It's an extremely sensitive event that likely could have traumatized this young girl. Which it did. So Diane decides it's a good idea to write this event into a TV show, solely because she's mad at Bojack for saying that the two of them are equally screwed up. If this is the kind of thing she does and feels no remorse for, then yeah, maybe they are. I don't really care about her airing Bojack's dirty laundry like this. He kind of deserves it. What I don't like is how she does this with no concern for the victim's privacy. Obviously, there's no way for the general public to trace this back to Penny, but can you imagine if it somehow made it back to her that this traumatic event she experienced was written into a popular TV show starring the man who did this thing to her? That's extremely f***ed up, and I would hope Diane would have the common sense to realize that either immediately or eventually. But 
No, she never feels remorse for doing this, and it feels genuinely out of character for her. I felt this way ever since the episode first aired, and it hasn't really been easier to stomach over multiple rewatches. Also, why the fuck was there some random 17-year-old girl on a submarine? Flip, you hack! Again, I love Diane's character overall, but this one action has always rubbed me the wrong way, and I never really hear anyone talk about it, whether they love or hate her character. Also, if you're wondering why I'm calling Diane out for this one action and not really doing the same for Bojack's heinous actions, that's because the show already does that, and if I did that too, then this video series would go on for 37 years. Then again, think of the ad revenue if we did that. No, I mustn't get distracted. It's Halloween! Let's focus on Spooky! Note, we are writing this part of the script on November 5th. It's Halloween, and in this episode, Ryan Seacrest type has finally had enough and fucking gouges Bojack's eyes- Wait, what? That doesn't happen? Okay, so this episode is another gimmick episode, this time using four separate timelines. Every Halloween, Mr. Peanut Butter and a bunch of other Hollywood haunters crash Bojack's house for a Halloween party he doesn't even want! And we get to see this party in multiple eras. We see it in the 90s when he's married to Katrina, in the early 2000s when he's with Jessica Biel, the late 2000s with Diane, and in present day while dating Pickles. Wow, when it's all laid out there for us to see, Mr. Peanut Butter is kind of a fuck up, isn't he? And this episode really hammers that on. Hard. Mike's hard. Every year at the party reveals a crucial flaw with each marriage, and piles onto the one thing that we've been shown time and time again about him. First with Katrina, we see him constantly running around and leaving her alone despite her exact request not to leave her alone. Yet every turn he abandons her to hang out with someone else instead of just bringing her along and having her engage with the guests too. This goes on all night until she's left with Ben Stein and Tim Allen. This is how she falls into the QAnon rabbit hole. Pour one out for her fallen Karens. With Diane, she wants to be the cool laid back wife, so she suppresses her hatred of parties to appeal to him. But being around all these celebrities makes her anxious, so she tries to hint to Mr. Peanut Butter that she would like to leave soon, to which he does nothing! And after an embarrassing encounter with one of her favorite TV stars from her youth, she freaks out and makes him leave. Can you guess what the star is? It was Bojack. With Jessica Biel... Okay, that one isn't even his fault. Jessica Biel's just a fucking idiot. And now in modern day, Bojack brings up how Mr. Peanut Butter has brought so many ex-wives to the party that it's hard to keep track. Pickles is very put off by this and acts standoffish to Mr. Peanut Butter after this. Yeah, it's kind of Bojack's fault, but also it's his house getting commandeered every year without his permission. So yeah, he probably deserves some sort of comeback. This all leads to Pickles hiding out in the bathroom. This is the part where it gets acknowledged that despite the fact that Mr. Peanut Butter is roughly the same age as Bojack, about 50-ish, and still dating exclusively women in their 20s, which is kinda sorta creepy and scummy. You kinda forget his age since on the outside he just looks like a big puppy dog. Which is, you know, the point. It's equally scummy that he doesn't even consider dating older women when Diane suggests it. He just immediately asks her what the alternative is. Yeah, kinda f***ed up. But Diane helps Mr. Plankton Boomer realize that he needs to grow up and emotionally mature himself, or else the women he dates will continue to outgrow him. She also consoles Pickles and lets her know that despite how many times Mr. Penis Bitches has failed at the whole relationship thing in the past, he still unconditionally loves the person he's with at the time, and would never do anything to hurt them. Oh no, my mouse slipped! and I accidentally clicked three episodes ahead. I hope nothing in the episode I just clicked on has any sort of dramatic irony to it related to what I just said. Oh no! Yeah, Mr. Porcupine Binger may be my favorite main character in the show, but he's still an extremely flawed person, much like the rest of them. And it's nice to finally get an episode that examines his flaws and points out the common thread between his previous relationships and why they all failed. It's you, Mr. Peanut Butter. It's you. Do you, do you, do you get it? Do you, do you get my joke? I was referencing the, the other, the other episode. Do you get my joke? We get to see a lot of other cool stuff in these different time periods too. Like Halloween night 2009 is actually when Bojack and Diane first met. He's the only one that recognizes what her costume is, which is a nice touch that solidifies their unique connection. But he dismisses her because he's just getting the news about how his dad died in a duel. This is also when Bojack first meets Todd and just lets him sleep on the couch forever. Until, you know, Todd gets sick of his shit. PC is dressed as Amelia Earhart one year. Nice touch. And she gets stuck manning the door every time. A metaphor for her perpetually wheel-spinning career. And there's a lot of funny costume-related easter eggs where background characters are dressed up as relevant pop culture icons from each year the episode portrays. And one of them is Shrek. This is important information that must be shared. So yeah, really fun episode. A nice spooky time. And you know what's even spookier than spooky Halloween episodes? Crippling drug addiction. Like the crippling drug addiction Bojack has. <laughs> 
That joke's not in bad taste, right? Look, there's only four episodes left. We have to make jokes while we still can. In fact, let's start with the jokes first. Todd builds a sex robot. <laughs> he did what? So, Emily wants sex, but Todd doesn't want to sex, so Todd builds a sex robot. I know this is Bojack and a lot of wacky bullshit happens in the show, but like... A sex robot. A dilly old dog rolling around flirting like a horny Stephen Hawking. This is a bit too out there even for Bojack. It's still funny and works enough, but I think we're pushing at this point. Granted, a sex robot really should be pushing it since that's its jab. Don't you mean job? I know what I said. I, for one, enjoy a sex robot becoming the head of a major company since everyone mistakes his sex talk for business talk. But yeah, I'd be lying if I said the joke didn't get extremely ridiculous and maybe a bit too unbelievable as it goes on. But we'll get to that in the finale. It's also probably the most blatant metaphor for sexual harassment in the workplace. A sex robot that only speaks in euphemisms and outright requests for intercourse becomes the CEO of a major entertainment company. Th that writes itself. And he gets away with everything he says. God, don't you just love America? No, no you don't. I hate it. Meanwhile, Mr. Pina Colada wants to make a movie based on a birthday card called Birthday Dad. At the time, I never imagined this joke would go any farther than this one episode, but no, they keep it going in season six. It's pretty great, honestly. But uh-oh, who owns the birthday card? It's PC's ex-boyfriend, Ralph, meaning she needs to meet with him, which is kind of an awkward scenario given how they left things. But everything seems to be okay between them. That is, until they find out that a woman giving birth at the hospital doesn't when her baby and PC should come on down and be the next contestant on I don't even know where I was going with that joke William finished the joke for me well the baby's father clearly finished <laughs> and so did Mr. Fondle wow we're reaching around a lot today just like Mr. Fondle <laughs> ah, sorry you like that Ben you like that it's fucking hilarious right so gonna kill him, really. I just noticed in my most recent viewing that Tracy is playing a Switch in this episode. What do you think she was playing? It's 2018, so like, Kirby Star Allies maybe? That's a game as mediocre as she is. Ooh, hey, bada bing. Hey, at least she's not playing mobile games. <laughs> Now, when this season first started, I was extremely confused that PC's plot revolved around her wanting to adopt a baby, given how she was pretty adamant about not wanting to in season 4. And in this episode, Ralph addresses this contradiction, pointing out how bizarre it was that she broke up with him after he suggested adoption. I agreed with him at first, it seemed like she kinda did him dirty there. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that despite his good intentions, it really wasn't his prerogative to try and dictate to PC the way she should have a baby, even if he was gentle about it. At the end of the day, he should have respected her desires as the mother and considered the position she was in, how she wanted to give birth to a baby for so long, and how she needed to come to the realization herself that adoption was the best option for her. It's tough, because Ralph is still a pretty genuine sweet guy, but in the end, he's just got to accept the way things are and move on. PC is raising this baby by herself, except oh no, she gave such an inspiring speech about what a good mother she'll make that the baby's birth mother is inspired too and wants the baby back. Oops! Oh no, back to the lab again. Back to the lab again, not again. You know, in retrospect, PC telling the girl that, oh no, you definitely can't, is the most unintentionally brutal thing she ever does. Hilarious, but goddamn. I think that's enough on the subplots. Not much to really analyze here. Time to do drugs. <laughs> so Hollyhock visits Bojack in LA so the two can have a fun-filled day before she has to go back to college. I sure hope nothing fucked up happens to them, especially since Hollyhock is still reeling from what happened with Bojack's mom and the diet pill overdose thing. What the fuck are you doing?! So Hollyhock mistakes Bojack's prescription painkillers for the same pills she overdosed on in Season 4 and pours them down the drain. Now they have to find her Plays some pills since Bojack notes that the pills are highly addictive if you aren't taking proper doses, and you can't just walk out of the store with like 50 bottles of the stuff. Over the course of the episode, it becomes obvious that Bojack doesn't need this medication for pain anymore. He's just become addicted to them. So much so that he's spending the little time he has with Hollyhock during this visit doing all sorts of wacky, dangerous hijinks to get them back. This is essentially where the main conflict of Season 5 finally rears its ugly head. And this is yet another element of the season I wasn't big on at first, but grew to really appreciate as time went on and I thought about it more. Bojack's main conflict this season is his addiction to drugs, which kinda sprung up out of nowhere much in the same way that Hollyhock's overdose in the previous season came out of nowhere. But this time, I don't see it as a problem because that's just how addictions are. They show up out of nowhere sometimes and take control of your life without you even noticing. I thought it was a little weird that this plot 
plotline started with Bojack getting hurt off screen in an episode that was focused on Princess Carolyn, but that was actually a clever way of setting the plotline up without drawing explicit attention to it and really blindsiding us with its effects later in the story. And while I have slightly come around on the sudden Hollyhock reveal in Season 4, I still don't think it particularly works as well because it wasn't set up. We don't see Beatrice ever adding the medication to Hollyhock's coffee in the background or anything. With this season, you're given all the pieces to recognize Bojack's potential addiction problem in the future without it being obvious, which is the best way they could have laid it out. Maybe it could have had a little more build up in episodes 7 and 8, like have him take some more drugs at the Halloween party or something, but otherwise, it's a really good setup. I would just like to say though that this is the main conflict that leads to the season's big climax. This doesn't hit us until episode 9 of this 12 episode season. Season 5 is very backloaded. It works and allows these moments to really hit hard, but I think they could have gotten us to this point in an episode or two sooner and then focus on it a lot more to have a better build up to the final episode 11 climax. Regardless, it still makes sense. Addiction isn't really something that gets choreographed in real life. It's a bitch. I think. I don't know, I've never smoked a heroin before. The important thing now is that Bojack gets help to deal with this addiction. Ah oh shit, this is Bojack we're talking about. Yeah, so after all this drug chasing chicanery, Bojack and Hollyhock had kind of a strange night together. But it seems like everything is gonna be fine right before she leaves. They apologize to each other, and Bojack confesses that he might not even need the pills. Hollyhock tries to reassure him that it's okay to take painkillers if you're actually hurt, and a doctor prescribes them. Oh no, yeah, yeah, no, that's not good. Hollyhock's words were definitely well-intentioned, but Bojack took the worst possible message from them, and his self-destructive tendencies led to him purposely getting into an accident just for the sake of getting drugs again. It's like that guy told Pac-Man once, drugs are bad. Oh shit, here comes Bojack! What's up, bitches? No, Bojack? Drugs are bad. <laughs> Okay, episode 10. The premiere of Filbert is nigh, and they're throwing a big premiere party, showing everyone the first episode of the show. Everyone's excited, and early reviews of the show are positive. It's Bojack's first big success since horsing around. <laughs> what, Secretariat? No, silly, he wasn't even in that one, remember? Now, last episode ended on a dark note, and from here on out, this is where things get really rough. But before we get into the nitty gritty, let's do some copyright bullshit. So PC gets grilled by this circus reject, Mr. Abel Ziggler, over the fact that they stole a joke from their popsicle sticks. Yep, in this universe, popsicle stick jokes are under copyright. This might sound like one of those big, jokey Bojack things that wouldn't happen in real life, like Disneyland or Halloween in January. However, you may not be aware of the fact that phrases like, let's get ready to rumble, and it's on like Donkey Kong, are under copyright. You legally cannot say those in a movie without clearance. Hell, remember when Zenimax tried to copyright the word scrolls? Or when Disney tried to copyright Dia de los Muertos? Yeah, that happened. This kind of thing actually happens in real life, and this is Bojack doing a takedown of those by literally making them into vaudeville clowns. Brilliant. This is the show's last chance to do something really wacky before episode 11 takes us on a downward spiral, so their presence while jarring is welcome. The only way to keep the joke in is to get clearance from both Abel and his partner Ziggy, who he hasn't seen in over 30 years. I smell hijinks! It's up to PC and Flip to get these ex-lovers back into each other's good graces so they get the legal clearance to tell a joke. This is the future dem publicans want. Of course, they do succeed in the end by acknowledging that the others both have hard jobs. While completely unrelated to basically everything that's been happening this episode, this plotline is pretty amusing against the darker backdrop of everything else, and does a good job poking fun at the sheer lunacy that is copyright law. You want to see how fucked up copyright and trademarks can get? Look up who owns King Kong. It's bananas. Before we get to the real meat of this episode, I just want to point out that it starts off with the return of Margot fucking Martindale! Like, they know what a big reveal this is. We haven't seen her since her boat sank in that spaghetti crash back in season 3. And now she's back and she appears to have lost her memory! Holy shit! I wonder where this plotline is going to go in season 6! Six. It probably won't be incredibly disappointing. Also, there's a giant balloon of Bojack. Huh, interesting. I wonder if that comes back. So before introducing the pilot episode of Philbert, Bojack gives a semi-improv speech about how Philbert is kind of a terrible person. But that's okay, because deep down, everyone is terrible. And it's okay to be terrible, since everyone is. Obviously, Bojack is very, very wrong, and Diane realizes this and is shocked by what he has to say. And this is some pretty clear meta-commentary about the show itself. 
The writers are basically drawing a line in the sand and saying that if you watch this show and relate to Bojack and then try and justify some of the shitty things you do in your own life because you feel really bad about it, just like Bojack does, that's still not okay. And Diane serves as the voice of reason in this episode, telling Bojack that that's a bad message to leave people with while also relaying that to the audience. And what I like about this is the fact that it's not on the nose or unsubtle. It fits really naturally into the show itself and the directions both of these characters are going in. This pivots into a conversation about what happened in New Mexico, which I mean, clearly this conversation should have happened a long time ago. Bojack even points out that she never asked about it before when she says he never told her about it. But to be totally fair, he should have come clean about it a while ago, like back when it first happened probably. It's not an excuse for Diane to write that event she had no idea about into the plot of Filbert, but Bojack could have also come clean to her about it right after she did that. Basically, he's still more in the wrong in this scenario. In fact, in every scenario, he's more in the wrong. Rule of thumb, er, er, hoof. If you have to ask, should Bojack have talked to someone about something? The answer is yes. Yes, he should have. The conversation then pivots to Bojack rattling off a list of bad things he did to women over the decades and saying that he considers himself to be the biggest victim to come out of everything he did. And while he certainly has suffered a lot with the guilt and remorse he felt for a lot of his shitty actions, he's of course wrong again. He may be suffering, but some of the people whose lives he ruined are suffering even more. A lot of stuff from this chunk of the conversation gets directly followed up and expanded upon in Season 6, especially the part about Sarah Lynn. In all honesty, there's so much to chew on with this 6 minute conversation between Bojack and Diane that I think we'll have to put a pin in some of it and revisit it later with the context of Season 6. The conversation wraps up with Bojack telling her that ever since she wrote that successful book about him, he's been totally okay. He's entirely in denial over over the idea that he has to grow or change or get better any longer, because the adoration he received from his book or the warped messages he took away from Filbert have blinded him to the reality of how horrible the situations he caused were and how many lives he's fucked up. Nope, he's totally fine now. He even tries to explain and justify what happened on the boat with Penny by saying that nothing had happened yet. Diane calls out the yet only for Bojack to backpedal and state that nothing happened. In his mind, his shitty, immoral action is justified, because it's not like the women he does bad things to will even remember it, right? The person who suffers the most from any of this is him, right? In my mind, this conversation is an absolutely necessary rebuttal to anyone who considers coming to the defense of the character of Bojack Horseman. Todd's rant in Season 3 where he cut ties with Bojack was just the appetizer to this damning, seething, incredibly compelling breakdown of why Bojack fundamentally does not deserve the same sympathy he is usually afforded by large sections of the fanbase. That's not to say that he doesn't have sympathetic aspects of his character. I mean, obviously he does. We wouldn't be watching the show at this point if he didn't. But the fact remains that he is the exact opposite of a role model, and no one should aspire to be like him or do the things he does. And he shouldn't be forgiven for his immoral actions, considering the fact that he never truly makes things right. He's an incredibly compelling character, but don't believe for a second that he's a morally correct one. I mean, goddamn, the show spends five seasons showing us time after time and outright telling us that Bojack is a bad person and that he needs to go get help. And people were out there saying, oh my god, Bojack is just like me. Bro, fucking read the room, talk to your mom or something. Get help. Also, this episode ends with Diane and Mr. Peanut Butter having sex. Mr. Peanut Butter, you dumbass. I would go more into that, but this will not be brought up again until episode 12. The next episode is not episode 12. That's right, boys and girls. It is once again time for another round of heartbreak and disappointment with episode 11. And this one's a real showstopper. Get it? Because there's no B-plot in the episode, so they stop the show to focus on Bojack. That's what jokes are. The other characters do still appear briefly, but they do not get any real spotlight, aside from maybe Todd, who stops the show to inform us he forgot to get sponsors in order to show ads during the show. What's well, a good thing we remembered ours, no offense to Todd, but we're built different. Hey James, tell the lovely people who the sponsor is for this episode. Surfshark VPN. So season one of Filbert is out and it's a hit. Gina is a bona fide celebrity now and Bojack is back in the spotlight once again. The show even got picked up for a second season, ensuring a steady paycheck for both of them. In their blossoming relationship is now much more serious. Bojack finally has another hit show, popularity, a loving girlfriend, and aside from Diane, it seems like his other friends are at least tolerating him a little more. So Bojack can finally be happy, right? Right? 
No, of course not. Do you even know what show you're watching? Filbert. Filbert, you're watching Filbert. See? Yeah, this episode gets experimental. It flashes back and forth between the real world and Filbert's world. Reminder, Filbert's apartment looks exactly like Bojack's, and Bojack has worn his Filbert costume all season regardless of whether he was acting or not. I wonder why they built that up all season. Yeah, this episode's very clever in how it takes little pieces that were built up throughout the season and finally connects them all together to make one thing absolutely clear. Bojack can't tell what is and isn't reality anymore. He's been stuck doing late night sleep deprived shoots for this show, on a set that looks exactly like his own house, with a costume he keeps forgetting to take off, with plot lines that are starting to resemble events in his actual life, and as an added bonus, he's getting addicted to those painkillers he started taking after his accident on set. This is basically just like what they did in season 3 with Mr. Peanut Butter's Spaghetti Strainer adventure, except now it's the main plot of the season, and it's depressing. With that said, while it's incredibly clever how this episode ties all those threads from across the season together, I honestly think this is one of the weaker episode 11s quality wise. Like season 2 and 4 basically had perfect ones and without saying too much, season 6's penultimate episode is also kind of perfect. Basically the even ones are the true phenomenal bangers, with the odd ones still being great and most importantly still being really impactful in the end, but still not quite perfect. It's just like the Star Trek movies, except none of these are bad, and we've actually watched BoJack Horseman. Yeah, the odd episode 11s tend to meander a bit, and they're not the most focused. Which, I'm sure is by design, because they all involve BoJack taking a bunch of drugs. But I still think out of these three, Season 3 had the best and most focused one. It was a really tragic deconstruction of Sarah Lynn's character. With this episode, part of me feels like it's going through the motions, and it's a little too similar to Downer Ending, and that's too much, man. We've just seen BoJack go on crazy drug trips and act paranoid and defensive enough to know what to expect here. Until the last third of the episode. Oh my god. But before we get to that, I do want to acknowledge how Netflix basically parodied themselves. Now that we actually get to see an episode of the show, it really does feel like the big budget schlock that you would randomly find get thrown onto your front page. It's all dark and epic, and we got tits and explosions. It takes itself so seriously despite how unhinged it is. Their first season ends with nuclear bombs blowing everything up. That's how Return of the Living Dead ends. When your detective show ends the same way a wacky zombie horror comedy ends, you know you've left the realm of reality long ago, just like BoJack. But let's stop the show for Filbert and talk about the showstopper's titular showstopper. Cue music. As Bojack continues to lose his grip on reality more and more, he starts to believe someone's trying to take down him and Gina and the show as a whole. And eventually, his delusions manifest in the form of a black void where Gina is there to greet him and then sing a musical number that chronicles Bojack's bitter life and a lot of the terrible things he's done. This number is really strong and a good payoff to Gina's love for musicals earlier in the season. It's a unique way of showcasing Bojack's grief and the show hasn't done anything like it before. And I could bring up what the words don't stop dancing until the the curtain falls as a reference to, but I think we'll save that for another time. I'm sure some of you would like us to dig into what's going on in the song as well, so let's touch on that. After Gina's intro, you see all the main and recurring cast members of the show sitting on a set. However, they're all played by look-like actors. Note that Mr. Peanut Butter is not there because Bojack does not like him. Gina then lifts Sarah Lynn's actress up and spins her around, cutting to a shot reminiscent of the planetarium where she died. We then see set pieces of all the biggest locations of the show so far, including Bojack's house, the observatory, the house of Horse and Round, the D, and the escape from LA next to Charlotte's house. The lyric, don't forget how fun you are, also fits in with this, with all the horrible misadventures he's gotten into at all these places. Very biting and sarcastic. Gina then walks into the Dick Cavett interview, harkening back to Secretariat being a big driving force for Bojack in the first half of the show, and how it was really where everything started for Bojack. We then see Bojack get dropped down in front of cutouts of some of his worst moments. We see the baby doll incident from season 4, the boat and penny, stealing the D, and Hey, what's that? We haven't seen that one yet. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. <laughs> hey, Bojack wrecked the cabin again. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. We then see all the products Filbert has been slapped onto as a result of Todd forgetting to get ads for the show and needing quick cash. But it also acts to reinforce how Bojack uses his sadness as an excuse. Hey, sorry I fucked up again, Todd, but it's okay because I'm sad. That's become his brand he sells to everyone every time he screws up. We see his mom tap dancing around until her death, referencing how she was a dancer in her time, but also how she was always on Bojack's mind. And now she's gone, and everything is worse now. So who does Bojack have to blame anymore? It's not a coincidence he's in the void for this shot. Also, the popsicles are a reference to the comment Flip makes earlier about those popsicle guys when Bojack asks where he gets his ideas from. Bojack is stupid. 
All right, I think we got everything. After Bojack wakes up from his musical theater riddled nightmare, we then get to see a scene from Filbert eerily juxtaposed with a scene from Bojack's real life. The music is subtly alarming, and it cuts back and forth between the two as tensions rise in both scenarios. Gina's calling out Bojack's drug problem, and he demands to get his pills back. At the same time, we see a scene from Filbert, where Filbert's revealed to be the culprit behind some murders, and he's required to attack Gina for the scene. And Bojack has lost his entire grip on reality at this point. After season 4, where it seemed like he was finally getting better and turning things around, he now just did the worst thing he's ever done in his life that we've seen on screen. In season 4, the one F-bomb was delivered by Bojack himself, describing a relationship he wanted to cut off but ultimately didn't, instead of someone else using it to end the relationship with Bojack like how it was in the previous three seasons. But now Gina rightfully asks him, what the fuck is wrong with you? And another relationship is permanently severed. And now Bojack has no more excuses to hide behind. Inside his mind, he ascends a flight of stairs, only to be greeted with a giant balloon of himself. One that was accidentally set loose in the previous episode, and continued to appear in the background during this episode. This simple image, accompanied by a silent credit sequence for the first time in the entire series. It's too heavy a moment for even the juxtaposition of the Back in the 90s song to appear. For the longest time, William and I weren't really sure what exactly this balloon represented, and I think it's one of the symbols in the show that's the most open to interpretation. One common reading of this image that I really like is the idea that Bojack can no longer deny that he is the source of everything bad that he does. Todd tried to tell him this in Season 3, but of course, he didn't listen, and the immediate next thing he did was going on a bender with Sarah Lynn, ending in her death. But now... He's confronted with the reality that he can't blame his upbringing or his parents any longer. It's staring him right in the face. He has no one but himself to blame for how he is. Another clever interpretation I've heard about ties into the idea that Bojack puts too much stock into the characters he plays. When he was the horse and horsing around, he felt better about himself because everyone loved the character. But now that he's playing Filbert, a character who's extremely similar to him and just as flawed, he has to confront the parts of himself that he didn't want to acknowledge. That got broadcast to the rest of the world through Filbert. And this balloon represents how his shitty traits are now out in the open, even if the rest of the world doesn't know how similar Bojack is to the character he plays. He knows, and that's truly devastating. So yeah, once again, a downer ending. Perhaps the biggest one yet for a show absolutely loaded with them. Personally, I think the balloon represents the fact that Bojack is full of hot air. But yeah, that's one way you can read it. It really is up to interpretation, and given how vague it is, I think that's kind of the point. Does it represent his ego? Is his head in the clouds like a balloon? Does he have to face himself? All valid responses, and unless Shout Factory releases the rest of the show on Blu-ray again so we can get commentary tracks from Waxbird and crew, that's all we have to go off of. Hey, by the way, Shout Factory, can you do that then? It'd be epic. And just like that, the episode ends. Yeah, this episode was rough, and the final moments with Gina were expertly choreographed through the entire season. Bojack eats his words hard here. Hey, remember Vance Wagner? Hey, don't strangle people. Welp. How he cornered Diane during the premiere and does it again here. Everything involving the pills, the sets being the same. Yeah, season 5 really called its shots for this moment, and the payoff hits hard. Episode 12, the show stopped. So after the incident, the footage leaks out to the press, and the Filbert crew is facing a PR crisis. Todd being the only sensible person in the room. Holy shit, Todd is the only sensible person in the room, what the fuck? Wants to pull the plug, but PC of course weasels her way out of it. So PC and Flip make a way out for Bojack, who is finally off the pills and conscious. But the problem is, he now knows exactly what he did, and wants to finally just end it all and come clean. But for once, he isn't allowed to. And Gina plays along because, in probably one of the more subtly heartbreaking moments, she doesn't want to be part of his story. She doesn't want to be known as the girl who got strangled by Bojack Horseman. She wants to take him down more than anybody, but knows that if she does, that's all anyone will remember her for. It's really painful to hear, because I'd imagine that a lot of women in real life never open up or go public about things that happened to them for reasons just like this, especially in Hollywood.
This is then followed by the sex robot accidentally being a sex robot and harassing someone and getting all the shows at what time is it right now canceled. Dark comedy mood whiplash. The season started with slapstick involving a mudkip family and lube. How did we get here? I'm gonna be real with you, Chief. Normally I love this show's absurdity and how wacky its scenarios can get, but the Henry Fondle stuff just got ridiculous by the end. The fact that no one considers the blatantly sexual things he says to be actually sexual statements starts out funny, but gets stretched a little too thin. But then his him saying things like insufficient power and now entering sleep mode getting interpreted as sexual somehow, they comedied too close to the sun there. It's just such an unbelievable stretch and it's not really that funny. Aside from this scene. Henry Fondle is a sex robot and he should not be a CEO of any company. When you say sex robot, you're speaking metaphorically, right? No. Again, why the fuck is Todd the most sensible character all of a sudden? Oh well, the Henry Fondle stuff is still better satire than Don't Look Up. Piece of fuck, stupid ass movie. We started writing this script in September and now we get to roast Don't Look Up, it's been that long. And while I'm complaining, PC is told by the southern woman that she can have her baby, and Stuart's here to bombard her with this news. And can I just say that Stuart's probably like the worst character in the entire show? Like morally there are way worse characters, but they're intentionally bad morally. Whereas Stuart is just unhelpful and annoying and a piss poor replacement for Judah. Which is the point of his character, sure, but they could have at least made him funny. The scene where he and Tracy both reveal that they have amulets that'll make them reconnect with their long-lost sibling, only for neither of them to realize that they're each other's siblings. Okay, that's funny. But that's it. Stuart is a completely worthless character otherwise. Like, at least Charlie Witherspoon was funny, and there was an actual payoff for his character. But whatever, PC really needs to get to North Carolina to get Babby. But she's gotta deal with the BoJack PR crisis first. But then the bigger PR crisis with Henry Fondle harms the whole company and gets Filbert cancelled. Which means PC can now go and get Babby. And Flip's last scene in the entire show is just him being like i was princess carolyn the whole time that's, that's it from him forever such a weird note to end on for what should have been a really hateable character it's just so weird how they keep giving him all these light-hearted comedic moments when he's the one who told them to turn the camera back on when bojack was strangling gina but i guess i never have to think about him again oh no how sad flip becomes leatherface and pieces the fuck out Anyway, back to the characters that actually matter. So Bojack wants to be held accountable for what he did, so he goes to Diane, who tells him off once again. This isn't the way to solve his problem. Just writing an article like this won't be enough. And frankly, she doesn't want to give Bojack what he wants. It'd also be weird after what Gina said for Bojack to just go immediately against that. Sure, it'd be for the whole Penny thing, but even there, he'd potentially be going against what Charlotte and Penny want. In fact, we know Penny doesn't want to be involved with him at all, so it'd be the same shit, different person. The only thing Diane is willing to do is get Bojack Bojack somewhere that will actually change him. More on that later. We have Diane here now, so let's talk about what she's been doing. She's been doing Mr. Peanut Butter. Hey, did we make a joke about his name having nut in it yet? So Mr. Peanut Butter cheats on pickles with Diane. Season 5 and 6 are really the seasons that show us that underneath that puppy dog face, Peanut Butter ain't much better than the rest of the cast, because now he is outright cheating on his loving girlfriend just for quick satisfaction. Oh, but Diane let him in and initiated it. Yeah, well, she's also single. She doesn't have anything holding her back. Mr. Peanut Butter could have said no. Mr. Peanut Butter, you dumbass. Well, at least he wants to come clean and be honest with Pickles by telling her what happened and end the relationship. Except not because he instead proposes to her. And the cycle goes on. We now trade a B for C and PC gets Babby. So she goes back down south and gets her Babby Porcupine, which she so lovingly names Untitled Princess Carolyn Project. Oh god, this is not going to end well, is it? Meanwhile, Todd finally pulls the plug on Henry Fondle by killing him and burying him. He then rips off his business suit and walks away to pursue more Todd shenanigans, I guess. Yeah, you know how each season wraps up by setting up each main character's plotline for the next season? They didn't do that with Todd here, which is the first time in a while we didn't really have any idea what direction one of the main characters is going in next season. I don't know if they just didn't have time in this episode or they just didn't know yet what they were going to do with him, but subconsciously, this, coupled with Diane's setup for next season involving filming videos for Girl Crush not sounding super intrigued, and PC's main storyline appearing to be resolved in some form, this all kind of made me think that it was time to start wrapping up the show. I don't like it when shows go on past their prime, and I much prefer it when they wrap up in a satisfying way. And I always kind of felt like BoJack needed to stop at six seasons in order to lead to a satisfying conclusion. William has said many times that the show is split up into halves, with seasons one through three being BoJack's continued downward spiral, and season four marking a new era for the show where he wants to better himself. 
And with that in mind, it only makes sense for this new era of For the Show to be the same length as the first one, and mirror it as a result. There's only so many times Bojack can run off and abandon everything, or get addicted to drugs, or feel self-pity about the things he's done without actually bettering himself, before the show gets repetitive and played out. But with that said, this season ends with Bojack making an incredibly important step and trying to better himself for the first time in the series. A perfect lead-in for what would ultimately be the final season. But before we get to that important step, I wanted to mention an observation I made just now while talking about season 5. I don't know how I didn't realize this sooner. Pretty much every show out there usually ends the season off with a type of significant, impactful event that occurs in Bojack's episode 11s. They really just want to leave the viewer with some sort of shock or suspense, or something to chew on wondering what will happen next. But Bojack doesn't do that. They always have a breather episode afterwards in order to get the immediate reactions of the characters and see how this affects them. It's more important for this show to impact its characters rather than its audience. And I think that's a pretty neat aspect of this show that really sets it apart from every other one I've seen. You still get the shock of the episode 11 events while also getting to digest them alongside the characters, which makes them easier to relate to and identify with. Okay, we're finally at the end. So going back to what I mentioned about a page ago, Diane takes Bojack to rehab, but she doesn't walk him in. She drives him there and gives him the choice of whether or not he wants to go in. Diane is giving him the ultimatum. You say you want to get better, but you don't know how. Well, here it is. You want to get better? Prove it. Bojack needs to be the one to take the step and change. It's not Diane's job to fix him. Bojack needs to fix himself. He does hesitate at first, but in the end, he finally grabs his shit and heads inside. And with that, Diane is free, for now. And she drives off into the distance, and that's season 5, baby! This script is 28 pages long! Season 5 is a little rough to watch at times, intentionally so due to the subject matter. It is a little awkward how backloaded it is, but that's done just so the impact is much greater once you get there. It showed us cracks in characters that previously were always shown in a positive light. It gave Todd more to do, once again, which was needed. It was a big year for Todd fans. It has great highs, but I do think overall it might be my second least favorite season overall. Mind you, there are no bad seasons of BoJack. Second weakest season of BoJack is still a strong season of TV. And now that BoJack is in rehab, the stage is set for the big finale. I give it a good season out of 10. Season 5 is definitely a lot better than I remember it being. It does have some issues, like I think elements of its main plotline are kinda been there, done that for this show. And I don't love some of the characters it introduces, as well as some of the returning characters' decisions and plotlines. But ultimately, its main plotline is really clever and subtle in the way it's quietly built up over time, and then suddenly hits you like a truck by the end. It's not quite as strong as Season 4's main plotline, but it's still got a lot of tremendous stuff, and I definitely wouldn't call it the second worst season of BoJack, personally. We'll get to that next time. But I still think this season is fantastic. Another 9 out of 10. Incredibly strong and powerful in spite of its flaws. Oh my god, this took forever. It's actually been months. I never want to look at a horse again. So join us next time for Horse Show 6. Hey James, how do we end the video? I'll tell you, but first you have to help me. I need your credit card number, your home address, the expiration date, and the wacky numbers on the back. Okay, I got right here. Uh, one, two, three. Wanna come down here?